Hey everybody, I'm Dr. Scott Wharton, the TOS guy. Welcome to our viewers. I'd also like to thank everybody for coming to see all of our previous videos and continuing to watch them. Here's a reminder, you can reach out to us, to me in particular. You can find me on the TOS MRI website. You can find the Contact Us page under News and Education. And we answer lots of emails that way and we help people out. Today, I'm gonna to do another in our series of anatomy of thoracic outlet syndrome presentations or live streams. Please forgive me, I'm getting over a cold and uh, my voice is a little bit hoarse. Today our topic is gonna to be the brachial plexus. Okay, the brachial plexus is an intrinsic part of TOS, but TOS does not arise within the brachial plexus. The brachial plexus is very complex. It's variable in different people and as I said, TOS does not arise from the brachial plexus. You'll find out why if you stay till the end. So the brachial plexus, as everybody knows, is one part of the human nervous system. The human nervous system is kind of complex. Today we'll discuss in broad general terms, I'll try to keep the medicalese out of it so we can all talk about it in English. We, talk, we start with the gross anatomy of the thoracic, uh, sorry, the gross anatomy of the human nervous system. We'll talk about a basic way to divide the human nervous system so you can understand its functions and its pathways. We'll break down the basic building blocks of the human nervous system, the nerve cell. And after anatomy of a nerve cell, we'll talk about the anatomy of a nerve, which is made up from a lot of nerve cells. After that, We'll talk a little bit in detail about the brachial plexus, but more about what causes thoracic outlet syndrome. And this can help you understand some of your symptoms, why they show up in different parts of your body, why they show up only at certain times, and what the treatments are. Now this is a fascinating image. It is a completely dissected human nervous system. You'll see at the top, the brain. You'll see running down the middle, the spinal cord. And hopefully you notice all the little branches coming off the spinal cord. In the middle of the spinal cord, they've truncated, they've cut off some of those nerves. But you can see above that middle part, the brachial plexus. There are five branches that come out and they all join together to form a very complex network that goes to each arm. You'll notice how large the nerves are that go to each arm because the arms in humans are very complex, filled with lots of functions. Functions like feeding ourselves, like using a phone, like driving a car, like typing on a computer. So there's a lot of brain power and a lot of nerves dedicated to the upper extremities. And if you look lower, you'll see some of the nerves that go to the pelvis and the lower extremities. You'll see actually at the very end, the bottom of the spinal cord, there are two very big clumps of nerves. Those are called the lumbosacral plexuses. Those are the largest plexus in the human body. And a plexus just means a network you can see it's a branching, complex network of nerves. The brachial plexus, again, up at the top, is the second largest plexus in the human body. Now, as you leave the brain, you take the spinal cord, and this is a pathway for nerves that leave the brain and come back to the brain. Here's just a diagram of how the spinal cord runs down the middle of the spinal column. Easy to get confused. The spine, or the spinal column, is a series of bones with channels in them. And we discussed this the last time I spoke. It should be up on our website and also on toseducation.org so you can learn more about the spine. But this shows how the spinal cord runs down the spine and gives off branches at every level. Now these branches are simplified and they go out to all the different organs and muscles of the body and they bring back all kinds of sensation from the fingers, the toes, the body, back to the brain. This is the basic building block of the human nervous system, a nerve cell. Now, you'll see at the top right, there's a cell body. And this has a nucleus in it, a little round ball in the middle. And it's got little short branches called dendrites. Dendrites you could view as receivers, radio receivers. I'll explain that in a second. The very long, narrow part running from the top right to the lower left is called the axon and the axon can be several feet long, feet long. 
even though this nerve cell is microscopic and you can't see it with a human eye, that axon, tiny as it is, can run for feet as it goes through the body. Now that axon goes all the way out and it transmits a signal. It'll transmit a signal to the dendrite of the next nerve cell, or it might transmit a signal to a muscle, or a sweat gland, or a heart cell. But the axon is this very long wire or cable. It's a communication system. You'll notice that some nerves have a coating or a wrapping around them. This is in French, but don't worry. Axon is obvious. If you look at the bottom, you'll see what's called a myelin sheath. And that is formed by a nerve cell that creates many, many layers that wrap around the axon. It's kind of a fatty material that serves as an insulator. It insulates the nerve from the surrounding fluids and other nerves around it. At the very top picture, you'll see what's called a, a Schwann cell. This one forms a loose, very loose myelin coat around many different nerves. These are called unmyelinated in general. So there are myelinated nerves with this very thick multi-layered wrapping on the bottom and unmyelinated nerves at the top that may have a loose myelin layer around them. These nerves behave differently. Here's another comparison. On the left, you see it, myelinated nerve fiber. And on the right, you'll see unmyelinated nerve fibers. Those Schwann cells form an insulation around the unmyelinated nerves, but they don't insulate it nearly the same way as the myelin insulates the axon on the left side. So these nerves behave differently and they have different functions. We'll get into it a little more later. This is a micrograph, a photomicrograph of a myelinated nerve. It's like you're cutting right through the middle of this cable. So in the middle is the nerve cell and that's the axon. And around it, hopefully you can see rings and rings of dark, very thin layers. That's myelin. At the very top, you'll actually see the cell nucleus and the cell body for the oligodendrocyte that can make this, or Schwann cell, that can make this type of insulation around the nerve. Okay, once the nerves are formed, either they leave the brain or they start at the periphery of the body and they head back up to the brain. But they have to do it through the spinal cord. This is just a stylized view. The very top in the center, the pink, is the spinal cord. And in the center, you can see what's called the gray matter. And this is where a lot of nerve bodies live. And around it is white matter. It's the lighter pink. The white matter is really just a bunch of these axons or transmitters, the long wires that run from the nerve cell body somewhere down the spine in the cord. And then they communicate with something else. In most cases, they'll meet up with a cell in the gray matter. And then the cell in the gray matter that starts with its receiving signals on its dendrites, sorry, it's a fancy word, will send a signal down its own axon that may lead the spine. You can see these yellow things on the side are some of the peripheral nerves. And those are generally made of axons or transmitters or these long cables. Just another image of the spine. Again, the green would be the gray matter where the nerve cell bodies are. And around it is the white matter, these long axons that are the transmitters. And again, within the spinal cord, there are these things called synapses. That's where the transmitter or the axon meets up with a dendrite and it sends a signal across through little chemicals. And then the next cell body sends through its axon a signal out to the body. Or in reverse, nerve cells can receive signals from the body. Like if you step on something sharp, there's a nerve cell that receives that signal and through the same kind of mechanism, meets up in the spinal cord, sends a signal back up to the brain. Now, once the nerves go through the spinal cord and they leave the spinal cord to go to the body, they form what's called a nerve fiber. A nerve fiber cross section looks kind of like this. There's hundreds or thousands of nerve fibers. Remember, the nerve fiber here is the axon, the little transmitting wire that comes from any nerve body. So thousands of these band, band together like this with little blood cells for nutrition and little fibrous bands that form bundles around them. And they go out to various parts of the body where they come from the body back towards the brain. 
in the lower left, you can see this artist has demonstrated an unmyelinated nerve and a myelinated nerve, what they called axon. Remember, axon is just that long transmitting cable. So in many nerves, you have a mix of myelinated and unmyelinated. Now, this is another example here, same thing. The top left, you see the spinal cord. The axons or the transmitting cables come out from there. They band together. They form these nerves that are made of all these individual nerve fibers. Again, don't worry about the vocabulary so, so much. We're talking about principles here. And I want to get into another principle now. There are some basic divisions within the human nervous system based on function. There are motor nerves. A motor nerve is typically something from the brain that goes out to a muscle in the body and allows you to do this, allows you to do that. It moves the muscles of the body. There are also sensory nerves. The sensory nerve tends to arise from the body and head back to the brain. So as I mentioned, you step on something sharp, you're on the beach, and you have a sensor in your great toe that says that's sharp. And it sends a signal that races up to the spinal cord, meets another nerve, and sends a signal up to the brain. And the brain says, ouch. And then there's a reflex that actually rises within the spinal cord and it pulls back your foot before you even know what's happening. So those are sensory nerves. And finally, there are a third type of nerve called the autonomic nervous system. This autonomic nervous system is very primitive. All life pretty much has this if they have a nervous system at all. The autonomic nervous system will do things that you are not aware of. It'll control your heart rate. It'll make you sweat. It'll control your blood pressure. It does all kinds of things that are on a level that you want just maintenance to occur and self-regulation. So remember, there are motor nerves, there are sensory nerves, and there are autonomic nerves. Now, as you look at this nerve, peripheral nerve image, and you look at the little micrograph at the top right, you'll see that thousands of fibers are clustered together. Those fibers may be myelinated or unmyelinated. They may be small or large. They may be peripheral within the nerve or central. And this creates a different layer of when nerves suffer dysfunction. We'll talk about that a little later. Just remember within each nerve are thousands of fibers of different types and different positions and different functions. Now here's another image of the spinal cord with little nerves leaving it. And again, within those nerves, you see thousands of fibers. Some are myelinated, some are unmyelinated, some are big, some are small. When the nerve gets to its end point, it can do things like contract a muscle or control your stomach, how fast it moves food forward. Or maybe it starts in the skin in the lower left and sends a signal back to your brain about temperature or the position of a joint. So I hope you get an idea about how sensory and motor nerves work here. And on the lower right, of course, this would be an autonomic nerve because nobody thinks about how fast their stomach is churning. It just happens by itself. Now let's get to the brachial plexus. This is a, a famous anatomist who drew many, many images called Gray, Gray's Anatomy, which was also made into a TV show, which unfortunately I've never watched. But he did great um, images. And here's an example of the brachial plexus. As you can tell from here, is a very complex anatomy surrounding the brachial plexus. So lots of different muscles. There's the collarbone and the first rib. There's subclavian artery and subclavian vein immediately adjacent. If we separate and tease out the brachial plexus, this image, believe it or not, is actually simplified. It's a lot more complex than this. There are basic divisions or names of these things. We have five nerve roots that contribute to three trunks that contribute to multiple divisions, both anterior and posterior. They contribute to five terminal nerves that run down the arm. But those things are not really important. As a radiologist, I know some of them, and I use some of them, but it's really not critical to figure out all of the smaller parts or to name all of them, unless there's something very specific going on. The key point here is how complex this branching is. The second part is that within each of these branches, 
in different people, the distribution of those nerve fibers is different. You who are listening on one side of the country and you who are listening on another side of the country may have a different distribution of your motor nerves or your autonomic nerves from each other. And that means when we damage the brachial plexus, you may get different symptoms. Another point is that with all these branches, a point at which the plexus is stretched or compressed can be different. You could press close to where they arise from the cervical spine and you'll get two out of the three trunks, but you may press distally and get several of the divisions. So bear in mind, it's really important to know where the plexus is being affected, either compressed or stretched. And it's not just one homogeneous thoracic outlet. It's a very complex anatomic area. This is just an example to show you on the left are the nerve roots that come out of the cervical spine. And if you can follow the colors, you can see that they branch all over the place. The nerves that go to your lower arm on the inside may pass and cross over with other nerves that go to your upper arm at the shoulder. So again, this is to emphasize that with all this variability of branching and the variability within each nerve, it's really hard to predict any one patient having any one set of symptoms. You've probably all read how tough it is to make a clinical diagnosis of thoracic outlet syndrome because of all this complexity. The other part I'll add is even if your doctor diagnoses thoracic outlet syndrome, he or she would in all probability not be able to tell which nerve, which branch, which area is being compressed by what structure. Now, of course, I'm an evangelist for MRI because I think it provides a tremendous amount of this information. So that's why I talk about this stuff. Also, it's just kind of an obsession. Here's another picture. We've probably all seen something like this. The yellow nerves arise from the cervical spine. They form a lot of branching. They pass between different muscles that are by themselves very variable. They pass between the rib and the collarbone, and that space can change depending on the position of your arm. So again, there are a lot of areas where the plexus can be compressed or stretched, and a lot of branches, and a lot of variability between patients. It's a complex disease, and you need a specialist who understands this. As an example, this was the last time I spoke, I showed a disc herniation. I hope you can all appreciate on the right side of your image that the disc herniation is pressing on a nerve. When it presses on the nerve, it gets inflamed as shown in this picture. And then this patient can feel symptoms coming from wherever that nerve comes from. Now I'm gonna talk about this type of pain. It uses some fancy medical words. So bear with me, please. We talk about two types of pain, nociceptive and neuropathic. Nociceptive pain would be quote unquote normal pain. So when you step on that sharp object on the beach, a normal nerve gets a normal receptor that senses pressure, sends a signal in a normal way through a normal pathway to the spinal cord. It meets another nerve cell that picks up the signal and sends that signal up to the brain. Now that hurts, but that's a normal nociceptive pathway. Neuropathic pain is the other type, and we get concerned about neuropathic pain. Neuropathic pain would be just like you see in this picture. Let's say this nerve that's being damaged is the nerve that goes to your great toe on your right foot. Now, when you get pain, because this nerve is inflamed by the herniated disc, your body says, my great toe hurts, how? But you look at your great toe, and there's nothing sticking in it. There's no burn, there's no pressure, nobody stepped on your toe. This is neuropathic pain. When you press somewhere on a nerve, if you cause damage, there's a signal that goes up to the brain. And that signal says, pain, pain, pain. And your brain says, I'm getting a pain signal. And I'm getting it from that nerve that goes to the great toe. So your brain perceives it as pain in your great toe. Now. In terms of thoracic outlet syndrome, for all of you who are watching who have had or do have thoracic outlet syndrome, if we compress the nerves in the neck, any combination of one or two or four or five, when it gets severe enough compression or tension, your brain says, I'm getting pain and I'm getting tingling 
and I'm getting numbness. It's a complex mechanism, but the general principle is if your brain says this part of my arm hurts, it's not because there's something wrong with this part of your arm. It's because the nerves that go here in a pattern we generally know are being injured up here and your brain perceives it as pain down here. Now, damage to a nerve can also be complex. Remember, we talked about three different types of nervous systems, the motor system that sends signal to a muscle, the sensory system that receives sensation. If you put your thumb on a thumbtack, you're receiving a sensation and the autonomic nervous system that might control sweating or how big the blood vessels get in your hand, whether your hand is white like it's cold. When this, anything like this presses on the brachial plexus, it may affect some of those nerve fibers more than others. The motor nerves tend to be larger diameter. Those little fibers tend to be larger. The axon, if you recall. And that helps increase the speed at which the signal is transmitted. They also have a myelin sheath around them, and that helps them be faster. But it also serves as cushioning. So if you're pressing on a nerve, the larger nerve fibers with the myelin sheath, who are centrally located in that physical nerve, will tend to be protected. The peripheral nerves, the smaller nerve fibers, the unmyelinated nerves, can be damaged first. And those tend to be sensory nerves. So a lot of TOS patients will have sensory abnormalities, tingling, pins and needles, numbness, burning, anything like that, before they get weakness. If you're getting weakness in most cases from compression of a nerve, what we call nerve entrapment, that weakness is a serious indicator. It means that the pressure is deep enough and long enough to damage those central, larger myelinated fibers. Okay, the most protected nerve fibers tend to be those motor nerves. And when you actually get weakness and those motor nerves are involved, that means it's pretty serious. It means there's been long enough and deep enough damage. Doctors, surgeons, like to operate on nerve entrapment before there's any evidence of this motor nerve involvement. Because once you get to that point, it's much less likely to get recovery. So in the literature, some of the people who will say true neurogenic TOS versus disputed neurogenic TOS, their only difference was that the EMG, a nerve test, was positive in the patients with true TOS. Now those patients also happen to have weakness of their hands, which means they're very unlikely to recover. And in my opinion, from a lot of reading and a lot of experience, disputed TOS is just early TOS. We don't, I repeat, don't want to wait for it to become late TOS, where you have motor nerve involvement. That's too long, too much damage, and a much lower chance of recovering function. One more picture to show you. Look at the herniated disc on this one. See, it's pressing on a nerve. We can do the same thing with MRI. Really quickly, this just shows the collarbone and the rib squeezing the brachial plexus the same way that herniated disc was injuring that nerve root. Okay, so I'm gonna go back now to where I can answer questions. And uh, first of all, um, let's see what questions are here. Patrick says, good evening from the Netherlands. Hi, Patrick. So if you have questions, uh, I'm happy to answer them. I know that was a little bit dense. We're trying to make these things accessible to everybody, regular people who just don't happen to be trained in medicine. So we try to get rid of the medical terms. I have a question here. Can the brachial plexus be compressed in more than one spot? Would symptoms be different? Thank you, Dana. The answer is yes, absolutely. You can compress the brachial plexus on both sides at the same time, maybe to different degrees. You can compress it at multiple points. If it starts out as five nerve roots and you compress it just this nerve root, the symptoms will be simpler. If you go farther out where they're joining together, you're gonna to get symptoms from all of the nerve roots in varying degrees. And that makes it a very complex disease to diagnose. In general, a neurologist might look at you if you have 
a disc herniation. Let's say you have a C5-6 disc herniation and it's on this side and it's pressing on the C6 nerve root. Well, we know where that C6 nerve root goes in your arm. We know which skin area is involved. We know which muscles are involved. So a good neurologist can often say, I think this is a left C6 radiculopathy. And they say, go get a cervical spine MRI. And sure enough, on that cervical spine MRI, there may be a herniation at C5-6 pressing on the C6 nerve root. I read those all the time. That's what we do as radiologists. But now imagine that you have three different nerve roots compressed to varying degrees because you got one point on the brachial plexus where those nerves cross over. Where they cross over, you press there and you're gonna get a mix of symptoms. Very hard for a doc to diagnose that and really hard or impossible for them to know what anatomic structure is causing that compression. Now we have another question. Is a cold hand a nerve or an arterial compression? That's a great question. Thank you. So the answer is, I can't tell you. It could be either. But the odds are this. If you compress an artery enough to limit the blood flow to the hand, let's say you have a blood clot that blocks a small artery to your hand, that's a pretty acute, bang, it happened type of situation. And you'll have loss of pulses. Your hand will turn white. There will be very little anybody can do except go in and take out that blood clot. So arterial TOS causes these kinds of situations where you get a blood clot causing a sudden blockage of an artery, maybe up here, which is a real emergency, maybe down here, which is still an emergency. If your doc thinks that, he or she will want to go to surgery very quickly to preserve that tissue. If you've heard the term gangrene, gangrene is where you don't have enough blood flow and the tissue dies. So they act very quickly to treat that. To diagnose it, they could use an ultrasound or an arteriogram. You don't need one of my studies to figure that out. And I wouldn't wait that long. I would get a, a very urgent ultrasound or an angiogram, figure out where the artery is blocked and go in surgically to fix it. Now, if the nerves are damaged causing a cold hand, okay, that is absolutely a common occurrence in TOS. Uh, Wadislaw Ellis wrote a paper 30 years ago at UCSF where they took an um, infrared instrument and during surgery, he would evaluate the temperature of the hand and he would see when the surgeon would remove certain little pieces, which one would allow the hand to get warmer. And I think he found that fibrous bands were one of the key contributors. Once you removed a fibrous band, the brachial plexus was freed up and the temperature in the hand got higher. Another point I'll make is that a cold hand is usually from disturbance of the autonomic nervous system. Remember, we talked about this being the nervous system that controls these things you don't even think about. Blood pressure, heart rate, sweating, body temperature regulation. So if that autonomic nervous system and some of those fibers are compressed, your body will act funny. You should have a warm hand in a warm room, but you don't because these autonomic nerve fibers are being compressed. Now from 1910, I believe, Todd, a researcher in England, actually found in some patients that all these autonomic nerves were clustered together, not in all patients, but a small percentage, about 10%, I believe, and the autonomic nerve fibers were all clustered together at the periphery of a nerve. So this is the whole nerve, and right in this one spot were the autonomic nerves. And therefore, pressure right there would cause temperature changes, cold hands, disproportionate to all the other symptoms that we normally get with TOS. I hope that answers your question. How well does surgery work for motor nerve-involved TOS? How long are the follow-up periods for the studies post-surgery and general quality of studies to date? Okay, so that's interesting. The medical literature in general says that we treat a nerve entrapment or a nerve is compressed or stretched before we get motor nerve involvement. Most surgeons would accept this as the standard of care. As I said, if you've got motor damage, it's really a sign that there's been damage to everything else in greater proportion, and you're just starting to see the most resistant nerves 
get affected. In TOS, I don't think there are a lot of papers that talk about the outcome and the follow-up period, but one in particular by Klein, K-L-I-N-E at LSU. Um, they actually took patients whom the vast majority had motor symptoms and they went to surgery and they removed fibrous bands and they opened up the thoracic outlet. And there was clearly a difference between the patients who had motor involvement and the patients who did not. There was very little recovery in those patients with motor involvement. What I would say is, even though the TOS literature doesn't really divide up a lot of, there are many studies that divide up the motor involvement and the sensory involvement, and I would have to search for that separately, I would say that the compression of the nerves in the brachial plexus behaves in every way that we know, the same as compression or entrapment of every other nerve in the body, which makes sense. The brachial plexus is constructed internally like every other nerve in the body. It may have different branching, but it carries the same type of nerve fibers, has the same variability. So when we know from other literature that motor nerve involvement is not a good sign, we also know that the brachial plexus is likely to behave the same way. So while I can't answer your question and give you the follow-up periods beyond the Klein paper that, that I have at the top of my mind, uh, I do know that that paper certainly supported that idea that motor involvement, those patients did not recover much function. Again, the general saw is when we're treating nerve entrapment, we don't wait to that point. So you're not going to find many papers that publish that because, you know, most docs aren't going to say, I decided to wait on this one cohort and I decided on the other cohort of patients to operate early. It just would not be a humane um, ethical approach. So I don't think we're going to see anything like that come out that's new. Um, Jake says, thanks for making this information available. Okay, thank you, Jake. I'm really glad you could, uh, could join us. Do other parts of the body have structures like the brachial plexus that cause similar disease? Sturgis, thank you. Um, I'm not sure I understand the question, but I think I do, and please correct me. Just write us back as I'm talking. There's another plexus that's even larger in the body. If you remember that picture I showed you where the whole nervous system had been dissected, at the very bottom were these two large clusters, each one called the lumbosacral plexus. Now, that may be similar to the brachial plexus in several ways. It arises from multiple nerve roots. They come together, they join, they branch, they split. But there's no moving part like the collarbone and the rib to compress it. The pelvis is a lot more fixed. So there's a big element that's not there. And the mobility of the shoulder is also the greatest one in the human body. There's no other joint that's as mobile. So the stressors on those nerves is less. However, having said that, there is a disease called piriformis syndrome that we're seeing the same kind of anatomic variability. The nerves come out from the lumbosacral plexus. They start branching and splitting, but some of them get wrapped up in these muscles, the piriform muscles, piriformis muscles. And we believe that several of those variable piriformis muscles that shape differently from other people may be entrapping or compressing those nerves. So parts of it are similar. But in the bigger picture, I will say this. We know of many places in the body where nerves normally pass through special tunnels and pathways. In some people, they're born with an extra bony spur or an extra muscle. They don't have symptoms for many years, but sometimes in their 30s or 40s, or maybe they take up tennis or martial arts, who knows. But now those tunnels are too narrow for that activity. And so the nerves start getting injured or compressed or under tension because of those extra anatomic structures. And it behaves the same way as thoracic outlet syndrome. You get neuropathic symptoms. Again, sensory before you get motor or weakness. As I said, the brachial plexus is like every other nerve in the body in many ways, in internal structure. And it responds the same way to injury. So these peripheral neuropathies caused by anatomic variation with superimposed injury or superimposed new activity 
they behave the same way as thoracic outlet syndrome does. And I'll add one more thing, and thank you for the good question. If you have a simple nerve, the ulnar nerve, for example, goes through the elbow and it gets out to the side of the hand. Um, some patients have an extra muscle in that part of the elbow called the uh, Anconius epitrochlearis. I'm sure you're all writing that down. So this extra muscle does nothing. I mean, it's just a variant, as some people have it. But in some people, when they take up a physical activity or they have an injury, that muscle now is taking up space that normally it wouldn't take up. And so they get an impingement on the ulnar nerve. Now the ulnar nerve is much simpler than the brachial plexus. So most good docs can say you have ulnar neuropathy just from the symptoms. It's very strictly reserved to one area. It affects the sensory in the fifth finger and one half of the fourth finger. It means a classic presentation. Even some patients with TOS have ulnar nerve involvement. But because the nerve is more peripheral, meaning it's not all wrapped up in the central branching part, but it's already branched and it's way out at the elbow. So it's a much simpler nerve. It makes the clinical diagnosis much easier and it makes the causation to determine much easier. In that case, by the way, most docs would get an MRI. And they'd be looking for an extra muscle, swelling of the nerve, fibrous bands, bony spurs. Some of these same docs who might not get an MRI for TOS, which is a much more challenging area, but they'll get it for something like that in the elbow. So keep that in mind. I think in all fairness, um, the MRI is an awesome technology. Boy, I wish I had invented it and held the patent, but uh, that's not the case. But it's an awesome technology and it can really show tremendous anatomy to the advantage that we can make decisions based on small things we see. Thank you for that very good question. Let's see if we have another question here. Um, Kaya said, so prevention is best. Kaya asked the question about what the literature shows about the length of follow-up in studies and the motor nerve involvement and recovery. So yeah, absolutely, I, I know what you mean, I think, by prevention. Once you're diagnosed with a nerve entrapment, you don't want to stall. You don't want to delay. You want to treat it before we get motor nerve involvement. So one of the things we've done for a long time here, one of the things we're doing through toseducation.org is to spread the gospel. And you should tell all your friends, everybody who knows about this is one more person who spreads the word. And once we get more acceptance of this as a entrapment neuropathy, the more docs will approach it in a standard manner and will get people recognized sooner and treated sooner. Very important. Let's see, uh, any other questions for us? Okay, if we don't have questions, I wanna remind people to come back because I believe we have another session in two weeks. I'm gonna look at my calendar right now just to confirm for everybody who's watching. Bear with me. Yes. In two weeks, we're going to have a very special guest speaker, me. We're going to talk about the five things you should know about TOS. This will be a fun talk. I hope you bring lots of great questions. And I'm going to answer one more question now. I'm glad Lori came in here. Why isn't the white hand sign a confirmation of TOS? And what does it tell you? So the white hand sign, I believe you're referring to uh, Carlos Salmanoski, really, really great guy, a surgeon who's retired in uh, Virginia. He's a really good guy and he's, um, he spent a lot of time trying to understand TOS. And he has a, a triad, and one of which is the, the white hand sign. So he, he's a very sharp guy and uh, very dedicated to his patients. And he has um, kind of beat the drum about this sign because he thinks he's seen a pattern that other people haven't seen. So absolutely, I think that his awareness of TOS is right on. Now, not all patients show up with these signs. When you see the sign and it's there, you should be thinking TOS, which is just what Dr. Selmanowski does. I think on the other hand, the absence of the sign has not been proven to mean absence of disease. We talk in medicine about sensitivity and specificity. I don't wanna dwell on these, but if you have disease, does a test have the sensitivity to pick it up? In other words, of all patients with um, XYZ disease, if you do a CAT scan, if it finds 90% of those patients with a positive CAT scan, that's 90% sensitivity. It means 10% of patients have the disease, but it's not picked up by that test. Specificity means if you don't have the disease, 
and you get a CAT scan or any test, how many times does that test show up as negative? Does it rule out the disease? And that's important as well. But um, in this case, sensitivity has not been proven. So of all the patients with TOS, um, do we know how many have the white hand sign? I, I, from my experience and from talking with docs all over, I don't think all patients have that sign. But if you have it, that's a very strong indicator of TOS. And Dr. Salmanoski has, has spread that gospel for quite a while. And I'm glad we have people like him who are so observant and find these combinations of symptoms that should suggest the diagnosis. Kaya asked, does MRI of thoracic outlet change conservative treatment of TOS? I would love to give you an answer. We don't have an answer, at least not one that's data-based. So I'm going to share my experience. Um, I was on the steering committee of a group uh, several years ago uh, of all the biggest names in the, the country uh, for TOS. And we were trying to set up a multi-center trial with funding from the National Institutes of Health to understand what happened around the country, right? Different people with different practices, academic, non-academic, patients who were tall, short, fat, thin, lived in Seattle, lived in Miami. We wanted to get this consortium together. Um, we didn't include any significant imaging in that, unfortunately. Of course, me being me, you know, I thought we should do MRI imaging, but the, the majority of the people who were participants said, you know, we'll just get an X-ray and that's enough. And in the end, uh, we didn't get funding. So, um, number one, even if we had gotten funding, if we didn't do MRI, you know, then we wouldn't have gotten data. So having said that, there are no good studies. There are a couple of old retrospective studies where people will look back at an MRI and look back at the surgical outcome. That's not the standard of evidence nowadays. I have to say, based on my efforts to keep in touch with docs around the country and my being nosy and saying, what did you find at surgery? How is Mrs. Smith doing? What's the outcome on this patient? I have a good idea. Um, I will say this, in the practice of medicine, it's pretty much the standard of care when someone has an entrapment neuropathy to find the cause of that entrapment. Remember, I discussed this extra muscle at the elbow. Okay? That's easy to find on an MRI. And if a surgeon looks at you and says, you got an ulnar nerve entrapment and your MRI shows me an anconius epitrochlearis, I'm going to remove that muscle. It's a very simple operation with low risk and you will do better. Now, we don't do that for TOS. And I'm guessing that's because it's a very complex area. It's hard for all doctors. It's hard for surgeons. It's hard for radiologists. I'm just kind of geeked about it. I'm obsessive about it. So I keep studying it, you know, and experience makes a difference. So I see a lot of things in there that are there. I ask my surgeons to confirm. Sometimes we get some photos. And the MRI is very, very accurate at showing these things. So the MRI should be performed in any patient in whom a decision is going to be made about conservative versus surgical therapy, in my opinion, because we don't have the data yet. Every surgeon I work with tends to be conservative. If they work with me, they understand. I'm the first person to tell you MRI is not perfect. The disease is very hard to predict. We're learning a lot about it, okay? But there are some basic signs that we see on MRI, a lot of evidence of what's going on anatomically. If a patient has narrowing between the rib and the clavicle that's five millimeters or four millimeters, really severe, and we see thickening of the brachial plexus right at that spot when the arms go down, Okay, we got a pretty good idea that that plexus is damaged. That's clear. And the reason it's being damaged is because the collarbone and the rib are so close together. That's one example of what the MRI can show. It will also show if someone has an arterial aneurysm or if their veins are blocked with a clot or even if their veins don't have a clot, but they're really, really narrowed so that the blood cannot drain from the arm. Those are all signs that certain docs, not me, I provide advice, I'm a consultant, that there are docs who use this information along with their clinical judgment and say, you should be going to surgery now, or you should try six weeks of physical therapy and then revisit, or I think you can do better with, with conservative therapy. Let's give it a six month or a nine month trial. Almost all of those docs I work with will also have favorite therapists for physical therapy and other consultants that they trust 
because the disease needs to be treated by a specialist. In the field of physical therapy, you need to have someone who knows TOS, not just someone who says, yeah, let's glide those nerves, let's strengthen you. It's the wrong thing to do. If you watch Steve Talikowski, who's great at this, I'll tell you in great detail, he's great at this. So number one, it's teamwork. Number two, the MRI by itself should not be taken like any other test in isolation, all right? Um, take that example I gave you of the nerve and the extra muscle of the elbow. The person was born with that extra muscle. A lot of them don't have symptoms. Some of them don't get symptoms till they're 30. Some of them don't get symptoms until they join the WWE, okay? So the point is not to find the muscle. MRI would show that. The point is when the patient is symptomatic and the doc suspects this could be involved. We get an MRI, we show the anatomy and pathology, and now the doc can put together the findings on exam with the findings on MRI and say, these things match, this is my clinical suspicion. So a short question, a very rich question and a long answer. Thank you. Um, let's see if we have other questions. Herb, do we have any other questions? Okay, so short of another question, first of all, I thank everybody for attending. It's really great for us. Please spread the word, join our social media, go on Facebook groups, tell people that we're trying really hard to answer questions and to explain in normal human language what's going on, what the treatment is, what the diagnosis is. And um, Kaya, thank you so much for your nice comments. Um, all of you for attending, thank you so much. Please attend our next one. It's gonna be a fun one, the five things you should know about TOS, please write to us. Again, on my website, tosmri.com. Thank you, Kaya. On tosmri.com, go to the News and Education tab and go down there and do contact us. And then you can sign up as a patient or if you're an attorney or a doctor or a news media person looking for information. We answer all of those and they inevitably turn into phone calls or email chains. And we really try to help steer you to the right people to help you give you information if you have a specific question about TOS. And if you want to give us an idea for another talk or something we should cover, that would be super. We don't always know what you folks are looking for. What's the issue you're dealing with or what's the question that's burning in your mind to help you understand this? So, all right guys, share us, join us on social media, talk on Facebook, help out all these other patients who have TOS to learn about these resources through toseducation.org. Herb Rep is running that and it's an awesome website. You can go there and find all the videos we've done so far. Send us questions that you have. And uh, if you have TOS, let us help you. All right. Don't guess with TOS. Get an MRI. All right. Thanks a lot, everybody.